let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the Sabbath. And we thank you, Father, that we have a way that we can come together and fellowship together and encourage each other. Learn more about you and your plan. We ask, Father, that you cleanse our hearts and minds. Teach us your ways. Father, we ask that you would lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. So what, what I was thinking, and this is what I was kind of thinking on Thursday, is with everything that's going on, it might be a good... It might be a good opportunity, unless somebody wants to do something different. I'm totally open for, for doing whatever. But what I was thinking of, with everything that's going on, we are so close to the election in the United States. And, and what we realize as a group is that the United States is going to play a center stage role in the time of the end. We know that. I mean, how could, if, if there are any prophecies of the time of the end, and God has overlooked the most powerful nation that there ever has been on the planet forever, uh, really uh, excels even, you know, the Babylonian Empire by, greatly. The greatest nation that there ever was since there was a nation. And is it possible that they are eclipsed from the prophetic lines of prophecy in the time of the end. That, that would be negligent, gross negligence, I would say. And, and I can say that because I don't believe it is gross negligence because they are center stage in the prophecies. And this is what uh, a lot of people don't really understand they, because they're not reading these prophecies for the time of the end. They're reading them as if they happened thousands of years ago. But the prophecies themselves tell us when they will be played out and they tell us in the time of the end shall be the vision. So the time of the end is the time of the end. It's not the time of Alexander the Great or any, any of the people that followed him or came before him, those, that is not the time of the end. Um, and so what I thought, because I am becoming more and more convinced all the time, and I say that it's kind of tongue in cheek because I've been convinced for many years that we are in the time of the end, but there's been pieces that have been added to the puzzle all along the way since I've been preaching this message. Um, and it's been for far too long. But it's been the same message. And it's, it's kind of amazing. Do we have any Bible that this has happened in the past? Um, and I think we do. Jeremiah preached the destruction of Jerusalem for 25 years before it happened. If you can imagine that. Jeremiah is preaching the same story, downtown Jerusalem, for 25 years. you you got to figure that there were some people that were just getting sick and tired of listening to Jeremiah preach. Does that sound reasonable? Like Jeremiah, you got the same story over and over and over again. It's never going to happen. And... Um, and this is, this is the way the Bible was written. They're, they've been saying the same story for thousands of years, actually, that judgment is coming. So, lo and behold, we, are, we have our backs up against the wall now when judgment has come. And people are saying, well, they've been saying this for all these years now. And, you know, who knows, might be another hundred years, might be another thousand years, who knows. Well, the fact is, we've got the prophecies that show us exactly the events that are going to be transpiring in the time of the end. That's the difference that we have. Because we're told those prophecies would not be understood until the time of the end. Why would it be until the time of the end? 
because that's when the people that would be living would need the information. And there's the whole difference between this generation and every other generation. And, and so where are we today in the scheme of things? This is from, uh, I was just kind of looking back at some things. And this is from a presentation that I did in 2019. Yeah, that's five years ago. It was, I think it was Tabernacles of 2019. And uh, so this is taken, this little excerpt is taken from the book of Matthew, where Yeshua said, he was first asked the question, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And he came back with some little bit of talk about deception. That was the very first thing, as if deception would be rampant in the time of the end. And uh, I don't think he was talking about deception as far as the fake news is concerned, although we have quite a bit of deception going on in, in that realm as well. But he, he narrowed the gap when he said, many will come in my name saying. So the, the deception he was trying to address would be deception inside the body of Messiah. And I'm, and I'm saying specifically inside the body of Messiah. I say that for a reason because most people that talk about the Messiah and preach in his name, which is what he said, they're preaching in his real name, in the name of Yeshua. He's not talking about people that are preaching in somebody else's name. He was talking about people that would come preaching in his name. And uh, if anybody knew what his name was, he knew what his name was. So he's talking about people that are coming, preaching in the name of Yeshua. And he wasn't talking about people that were, that were preaching, saying that they were Yeshua but they were coming as a representative or teaching in his, uh, in his name or as a follower of him. So this is what he was talking about. So the very first thing that he wanted to address was the concept of deception in the time of the end. People that would be preaching about the second coming, they would be preaching in his name, which is in the name of Yeshua. So that really really brings it home to all of us that we need to have our antennas all up and and really listening carefully to what people are saying. And number one, we've got to be able to, obviously everyone knows this, we've got to be able to prove what we teach from the Word and the Word alone not somebody's idea about what the Word says, but we need to go back to the Word and really have another look at the Word because if people are teaching with the Bible, they're going to be using Bible. And of course, we know that this is how the enemy does it. This is how he did it with Yeshua. And if he used the Word on Yeshua, Satan himself, and this is how all his followers work that are trying to deceive even the very elect, they will use the word, uh, but the problem is they're not going to put the word together properly. And, and here's why. This is, it, it's really just this simple. It tells us in the book of Revelation that there are two characteristics that God's people will be in possession of. Number one is the word of God. Uh, they will keep the commandments. This is what it talks about in the book of Revelation. Over and over again, it talks about they adhere to the word of God and the commandments of God. And, and I put those two together. At the very opening of the book of Revelation, it says that they have the word of God and they have the testimony of Yeshua. So the Word of God is pretty simple. That means they're obedient to the Word of God. And, you know, that's, that's in itself, that's a little tricky because the Pharisees uh, appeared 
appeared to be obedient to the word of God. In fact, they went so far as to pay tithe in mint and cumin, but at the same time swallowing camels. So if you can, if you can get your mind around that, the idea being is for all intents and purposes, they appeared to be perfectly obedient to God's law. What would that look like? Well, number one, uh, they would eat all the right things according to Torah. So they would be Torah observant uh, on the surface. However, Yeshua said, but inside you're full of dead man's bones. So on the outside, they looked very, very good. Uh, I would rather suspect that their seats would be exactly the right color uh, and right length and all of these things. So this is, this is what we're dealing with in the time of the end. And, and so if we're listening to people that look right and sound right, but maybe they're not right. And we're talking about people in the body of Messiah, those that claim to be followers of Torah and, um, and obedient to his word. Does anyone know anyone like that? Any teachers out there? Do you know any teachers that would fit that description? Yeah, you might, you might not want to judge them and, and that's okay. So, so we've got that classification in the book of Revelation. The second one is where people get tripped up. And, and this is really the, the, the tricky one. Because it says that the they have possession of the testimony of Yeshua. And I want to look at that here because this is... And I know we've talked about this before, but this is so vitally important. Because these are characteristics. It'd be like, you know, if... if um, you know, I'm just going to use this as an example. If you're a Dutch person, you probably have blue eyes and blonde hair. You know, I'm just sort of categorizing here. But those are, those are characteristics of a lot of Dutch people, is they have blue eyes and blonde hair. And so if you saw somebody on the street like that, you would, you would probably think, oh, they're probably from you know, Northern Europe, somewhere there. Um, just an example. But in the Bible, it says that God's people will be in possession of two things. One is the word of God, and they will keep the commandments. So that's the possession of, of the word of God. They are obedient to the word of God, keeping his commandments. And also the other one is the testimony of Yeshua. And I'm really going to, I'm going to drill down on this one because this is, this is the Achilles heel of the church right here. It's not, it's not the word of God. It's not obedience to his commandments because you can look like you're obedient to the commandments, but the testimony of Yeshua is the Achilles heel. It's where everyone will be tripped up. Um, because they, you can't pretend on that one. And, and that's why I want to look at this carefully. So it says here, just turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. Give you a moment to get there. The revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, which God gave to him to show his servants, things which must shortly take place. Can somebody give me a definition of what that, what, what would you say if you could just put one word on that? He's going to show them things that must shortly take place. That's telling you future events, isn't it? That's prophecy. That's, he begins the book telling them what he's going to tell them. Events that will shortly take place. 
And that's very interesting. I don't want to get into, uh, into that, but maybe I need to because a lot of people take that just for what it says, but they miss the point of what it's saying. The, this is not saying that the events are going to shortly take place. That's what it appears. But what it actually means here is the events that he's going to show us are in and of themselves going to take place quickly. Did you get the difference? So the events that he's going to show us are going to happen within a short space of time. He's not saying that they're going to happen like in five minutes or ten minutes or this week or next week. Back then, he's saying these events that I'm going to show you are going to happen quickly. As saying it another way, when they start to happen, it's not going to be very long before the end has come. So that's really the, uh, the meaning of these words here. Now, it, then he goes on to say, and he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So it goes from God the Father to Yeshua, then he gives it to his angel, and then he gives it to his servant John. And John bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Yeshua, the Messiah, and to all things that he saw. What are the things that he saw? We're told what he saw. He, was, he saw things that would happen very quickly. That's what, he, that's what he saw. And so this is what he's going to show us in the book of Revelation. It says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Okay, so now he says, blessed is he who reads. So number one, we, we really should be reading it. And those who hear, so those that let the words sink into their minds. And what does it mean to let your, the words sink into your mind? We're told in 1 Peter that the prophets inquired and searched diligently. That's, I think, the intent of what it's saying here. For those people that will inquire, ask questions, what is going on? How can I find out? Well, it says here that we can find out by going to God's Word. And let it sink into your mind. Let it work over in your mind. And by doing that, we're going to have more questions that are going to be needing answers. And then we will... It's, it's kind of a, a circle that we just keep digging, we get more questions, we get more answers, we keep digging, get more questions, get more answers. And lo and behold, if we keep, if we keep on that track, we're going to have more answers than we have questions after a while, which, are, which is a good thing. So keep the words of the prophecy. So this, this, the testimony of Yeshua really is the issue that is going on here. Now, when we flip over to verse 9, chapter 1, it says here that I, John, both your brother and companion, companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Yeshua the Messiah, was on the island that is called Patmos for, for the reason of, the word of God, and for the testimony of Yeshua the Messiah. So he is in prison on an island for two reasons. One, he was obedient to God's word, which was he was supposed to be obedient to Caesar's word, but he was obedient to God's word. And he had the testimony of Yeshua. So we don't find out what the testimony of Yeshua is until we get to chapter 19. Isn't that interesting? We don't get to know what the testimony of Yeshua is until the last few chapters of the book. So in chapter 19, which is a second coming chapter, interestingly enough, chapter 19, verse 10, and I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. 
I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have, are in possession of, the testimony of Yeshua. Worship God for the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. So this is, this is the kicker right here. So God's people in the time of the end are going to be in possession of two things. The word of God, they will be obedient to the word of God, and they will have, they will be in possession of the spirit of prophecy. Now, if we go to chapter 6 of Revelation, and we look at the fourth seal, this is now the, uh, the four horsemen, chapter on the four horsemen, we get towards the, the end of the four horsemen, the last horseman. The last horseman is when persecution comes. So we're talking persecution here again. In verse 9 of chapter 6 of Revelation, I'll give you a moment to get there. Chapter 6, verse 9. Chapter 6 of Revelation, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls who had been slain for what? The word of God and for the testimony which they held. Wow. So people read that and they think, okay, well, that's obviously their personal testimony. They're on, uh, they're being, they've lost their heads because of a personal testimony that they had. That's a bad interpretation. That's not what it says. Uh, we can twist it and, and make it say that if we want. And it sort of works. But it's not what the intent of the Bible writer. The testimony which they held was the testimony of Yeshua. You see, Yeshua came in verses 1 to 3 to give us the word of God and the testimony of Yeshua John is in prison for, yes, the word of God and the testimony of Yeshua. Those in the time of the end are going to be persecuted. In fact, they will, some of them will be killed for two reasons. One is the word of God and the other reason is the testimony of Yeshua. What is the testimony of Yeshua? We know what the testimony of Yeshua is. It's the spirit of prophecy. That's the Achilles heel that's going to take so many people out because they claim to be obedient to the word of God, but you talk to them about prophecy, oh my, confusion, confusion, confusion. And somebody might say, well, you're pretty confused yourself. Well, maybe so. But we are diligently trying to figure this out. So apparently, the prophecies that would be sealed until the time of the end would be understood by God's people that are obedient to the word of God, and they will have the testimony of Yeshua. And the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is given to give correct understanding of the prophecies. So... I find it interesting, even amongst believers, that those that teach uh, rarely will dive into the book of Revelation. And then when they do dive into the book of Revelation, they leave off the book of Daniel, which the book of Daniel is actually the foundation. If we haven't got the book of Daniel figured out, we really have no business going into the book of Revelation. It's the foundation. If you're going to build a house and you want it to be rock solid, you want to go down to a good footing, put a good foundation in there, and then build your house on the foundation. But many people are just running to the book of Revelation because they think all the book of Daniel has already all been fulfilled. So there's really no need to go back there and do a review of something that happened 2,500 years ago. The, that couldn't be further from the truth. Daniel contains uh, information that we absolutely need for, for today. And, you know, sometimes we go and we look at these um, prophecies. And this is what I would recommend when you start getting into a conversation about uh, prophecy 
is take people to these verses because most people that haven't been sort of brain, and I, I use this word carefully, brainwashed, that they haven't been brainwashed to believe that all these prophecies have been in the past, what we need to have is somewhat of an open mind to, to be able to have a second look at Scripture. But if you wouldn't entertain the idea that there's a possibility that you could be wrong in your interpretation of Scripture, then it's very unlikely that you would actually stop and take a second look at anything. But I would propose that we all need to take a second look at something here. In, uh, in Daniel chapter 8, Daniel sees a vision, and uh, we're aware of these visions. Daniel saw a vision in Daniel chapter 8 of a ram uh, and a he-goat. And there's a war between a ram and a he-goat. And then he goes on to uh, say once the ram is defeated and the he-goat he is victorious, then the, the large horn that was leading the he-goat is broken and four notable powers or kingdoms come up and take the place of the one. That would, that would demonstrate quite clearly that the number one kingdom uh, was, was the number one superpower in the world at that time. And then because there's a vacuum, when he goes down, the four other kingdoms that are already there, they don't just come to be at that point, but they're already there waiting like vultures to take over because the signs of the demise of the notable horn are all over the place. So, so that's what we see. And then we see a little horn power coming out of those four kingdoms. That's, I'm just sort of um, going over chapter 8 briefly. And then the little horn power does some things, ends up, it says, in the glorious land. That would be Jerusalem. Uh, little horn takes up residence in Jerusalem. This definitely has not happened yet. That's what it says in verse 9. Out of one of them came a little horn which grew ceiling great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. I don't think there's any question when the Bible speaks of the glorious land. We, know, we all know where that is going. So the little horn will end up in Jerusalem as the uh, universal empire. That's where he will have his last resting place is in Jerusalem. And it even gives a timeline of how long, the 2300 evenings and mornings, this is how long it will rain, and then it talks about something happening at the end of that. But the, really the, the most important part of this, this, uh, this chapter is not necessarily the details of the chapter, if we go back to what Yeshua was asked on the, the Mount of Olives, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And then he goes through and tells them the events. This is sort of the same thing here at the end after the, the vision is given. In verse 15 it says, uh, if you turn there, Daniel chapter 8 verse 15. This is after the vision. Daniel is quite confused. He has no idea what all this means. He goes on and, and now it says, Now it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning. There's the inquiring. Seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And a and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face, and he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. What did he just say? 
Now, I wonder if we can take it off mute here and see if we have a different translation that says it just a little bit differently. I'm looking for a different translation that says it just a little differently. Verse 17. Rob, I know you've, or Rob or Sherry, I think you have a different Yeah, as they're looking that up, I just want to make the point. So many people want to take the verse in Torah about two or three witnesses and apply it to prophecy. But obviously, if that were the case, God would have sent more than just Gabriel. If two witnesses were required for prophecy, why don't we see Gabriel and Michael or Gabriel and another here? I have the New Living Translation. Okay, let's try that one. Verse 17. Okay. As Gabriel approached the place where I was standing, I became so terrified that I fell with my face to the ground. Son of man, he said, you must understand that the events you have seen in your vision relate to the time of the end. Okay. So how, how can we interpret that? Does anyone have another... An, another translation. Yeah, I do have um, Gini B. I don't know what it stands for. Gini B. It says uh, the, vis the vision ha has to do with the end of the world. Okay. So this is what I'm talking about taking a second look. We've all been taught things in the past. And those people that have gone before us have been good-hearted people. They, have been, they haven't been out to deceive. They did the very best with what they had. But if it's true, if it's actually true that the understanding of the visions would not be until the time of the end when God's people would need the information, need the understanding of the information, then all those that have gone before us although good intended intentions in their heart are going to come up short because God's own words said that the visions would not be understood until the time of the end. And so now we've got people saying, well, the time of the end started in the 1700s or late 1700s, early 1800s. The time of the end is the time of the end. It's when all things are going to wrap up. Those people that have gone before us are dead and gone. What would happen, let's just entertain an idea here. What would happen if those people that have gone before us actually did not see all the events that are going to transpire in the time of the end because they weren't living in that time, and they fell short of an understanding of information that we need in the time of the end, but we don't have because we won't budge from the position that they held down 200 years ago. Are you with me? What would it be like if we rejected light that God is trying to send his church today because we are now in the time of the end. I think that's pretty evident. So if he's trying to send a flood of light on his people today, but it's different than what those people that we learned from believed, and it's different from the people that they learned from believe, and you can go way back two, three hundred years, it's different from what those people believed. Why is it different? Because God did not unfold the prophecies of the time of the end until the time of the end. And Tom, we've had some comments in the chat room I want to read to you and let you comment on. Because you were talking a little bit ago about when you were talking about the spirit of prophecy. And the question is then, so what is the gift of prophecy? Is it the ability to prophesy or the ability to understand prophecy, or something else? Yeah, good one. Okay, well, I asked Judy a question uh, this week. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to kind of dance around that one. for. We'll take a little bit of a detour here, because this, this is actually a fun one. So, we know, let's just, 
Are you guys okay if we go down this rabbit hole? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay. Because yep. it's actually sometimes when you go down rabbit holes, it's kind of fun chasing rabbits because they're they're very <laughs> bouncy and and fun to watch. Okay. So in in Peter. And, and you guys know this verse, and I hope you're memorizing this verse, because this verse is, is so amazing. We just really need to grasp what this means. Okay, so 1 Peter verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. I'll let, you, I'll let you go there. And I know you've probably got this highlighted, because this is, this is one of my favorite texts. I have built... I have built my mindset around this text, these two texts, three texts, actually. Okay, so 1 Peter 1, verse 10, starting at verse 10. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what? What was coming, the events that would transpire, and what manner of time. So they weren't, the prophets were searching two things, two primary things, which are exactly the same things that we should be searching out. And I believe we are searching that out. We're looking for what's coming, and we're looking for the timing of what's coming. And the timing is important because the prophets had to give a message to God's people. And they needed to give it on time. So they wanted to know what was coming and the timing of it, uh, the timing of those events. So they were searching what was coming and what manner of time in verse 11. The Spirit of Christ. Ooh. The Spirit of Christ. Well, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? So does this mean that the prophets of old, before the Spirit was poured out on Pentecost, that the Spirit of Christ was already at work in the prophets? Wow. Who said the Spirit wasn't poured out until Pentecost? There was a special outpouring at Pentecost, but the Spirit of Christ was alive and well in the prophets. What was the Spirit of Christ doing in the prophets? He was showing them what was coming and when it was coming. That's the Spirit of, of Christ, which is, if we go to the book of Revelation, the Spirit of Christ is the testimony of Yeshua. The testimony of Yeshua is the witness of Yeshua or the word of Yeshua to the prophets to show them events that are going to happen in the future. Now the question was, does that mean that we're going to have dreams and visions? Well, Acts chapter 2, according to Peter, uh, he pulled out a prophecy of Joel in Acts chapter 2. This is Peter again. He said that in the last days... God's old men, young men, young maidens, they will have dreams and visions and they will prophesy. So the question is, do you have to have a dream and vision before you qual can qualify to this? Uh, before you can claim the prophetic status? Well, I'd be, I'd, I'd be sort of uh, leery of someone that claimed the status of prophet, but... Uh, I know they're out there. But here's the thing. Was Peter a prophet? Yes. I'm looking at heads, and they're not moving either way. Yes, yes, he was. Peter was a prophet. What, would, what qualified him to be a prophet? He had the Holy Spirit. He had the Holy Spirit, okay. Any, any other? The testimony of Jesus Christ, of, of Yeshua. 
Sorry, what was that? I didn't catch that whole thing. He, he had the spirit of uh, the testimony of Yeshua. Okay. All right. And we know that Peter had, we know at least he had one vision. He had the vision of the sheep with the animals that came down. Um, we know he had, had a vision like that. And he had, he had some special understanding. There's no question. So we could, say, we could say that Peter, I think confidently we could say Peter is a prophet. But when you look at all of what Peter wrote, it's just a few pages. First and second Peter is really not that much there. Uh, but it's interesting what he wrote about, and he wrote about prophecy. That was the, one of the focal points that Peter spoke about prophecy, uh, prophecy being fulfilled. Uh, and therefore, he says it's as a light that shines in a dark place. I think we go over to Second uh, Peter to see that, if I remember correctly. Second Peter, uh, verse one, or chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one. We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises <coughs> in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit of Yeshua. Did you notice the change I put in there? Yeah. It's... Peter here says that it was the Holy Spirit that moved upon the hearts of the prophets. But back here in 1 Peter, he says it was the Spirit of Christ that moved upon the hearts of the prophets. So if the Holy Spirit interpreted the prophecies for the prophets... And, it, and then in the same breath, same, same Bible writer says that it was the Spirit of Christ, then I would have to equate the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Yeshua, who Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, same Spirit in us, the hope of glory, it's the same Spirit. So the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit of Christ working in us. That's the Spirit of Christ. So the Spirit in Christ was in the the Spirit of Christ was in the prophets, showing them what was coming and when it was coming. So the question is, we've got a few questions on the table. One of the questions is, do you, is a prophet someone that has dreams and visions? Or is a prophet possibly somebody that the Spirit of Christ is working on to give them an interpretation of the vision or the meaning of the vision. So let me ask you another question. Was James a prophet? Book of James. Was James a prophet? Maybe you haven't thought about that before. I think these are things that we might want to reflect on. What determines what a prophet is? Was James a prophet? Well, if you read what James taught, it's only like five chapters, I think, five or six chapters. Um, it would be quite evident that he was a pretty good teacher of righteousness. Would that make him a prophet? Well, how about John the Baptist? Was he a prophet? The greatest, the greatest prophet. 
Can anyone point me to a verse where it says that John had a vision? Oh. Hmm. Does anyone? Oh, James. Sorry, I go back to James. He, his uh, his cha his uh, writing do not contain any prophecy. It's just Christian, yeah, I mean, Christian living advice, uh, counsels to the church, to the community, but not uh, not like other people that we know to be prophets. Well, let's say, let's say, is there one, one shoe that fits all prophets? Or do prophets come in different, different flavors or different work? They define prophecy. So if we've got this idea that unless a prophet has a vision, they're not a prophet. Well, that's not biblical, actually. A prophet, a prophet technically is a teacher of righteousness. Now, that doesn't mean that a prophet, some prophets may have visions. Some may, some may interpret visions. If we look at James, actually, I think it's the fifth chapter. Um, he's starting to give a little bit of interpretation on prophecy. Um, and I'm not trying to prove anything by this. Just, just um, you know, he got into the canon. James got into the canon. What would, wouldn't it be some kind of, wouldn't there be some kind of qualification for James to get into the canon? He would have had to been a very well-spoken uh, individual on what the prophets taught and I think we can we can see that when we when we sort of dissect what James was saying if I can just find it here James uh, James 510 James 510 right my brethren take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience Okay, so now if we just back that up a little bit in, uh, in the beginning of the chapter. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries are, that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures for the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back for, uh, by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury, and you have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murmur, uh, murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. I mean, when I read that, I got prophet written all over those words. I mean, he's speaking with authority here. So, so the question is, and that's, that's kind of not my point, but it is part and parcel of what it means to be a prophet. A prophet speaks for God with authority. A prophet might have a dream and vision, but not necessarily. We have no record of John the Baptist, who Yeshua spoke of as the greatest prophet that ever lived, 
speaking of John the Baptist, we have no indication that John the Baptist uh, ever had a dream or a vision. Now, it is interesting that when John the Baptist sent to Yeshua the question, are you the one or should we be looking for another? I know there's I, different ideas around that, but basically he was, he was confused, if you will, to a degree, and I use that word carefully and respectfully, he was confused to a degree that Yeshua was not fulfilling what he thought, what John thought, the role of the Messiah would be. And so John didn't quite understand the prophecies that he was reading correctly, and he sent to Yeshua a couple of his best, asking him, are you the one, or are we looking for somebody else? And Yeshua, all he did was said, John, you need to go back to the prophets. You need to go back to the book of Isaiah, and here's some verses for you to find. And that is an indication of what the prophets do. They go back, take a second look, because maybe they haven't gotten it. It's the humility of the mind. And it's the willingness to go back and have a second look. And I know all kinds of people that uh, think they're following the prophet... And they will not go back to have a second look at the prophecies, plural. And, and this is a danger. I don't know why anyone wouldn't trust the Holy Spirit enough to lead them and guide them into all truth. Um, but that's the way people operate. Okay, so the question, I, uh, the question that was asked, what does it mean to have the spirit of prophecy? The spirit of prophecy could be like John have an understanding of what the prophets wrote that went before. For John, primarily, he was quoting from Malachi and Isaiah. That doesn't mean he didn't read the other prophets, but those are the ones that he seemed to, seemed to quote from most of all. And so he was, he was preaching according to his, his uh, searching of the prophets, and that's what they did. They searched diligently uh, of these things that they were going to have. So, um, so I think we covered that. Do we have any questions on, on any, of, any of that? So in, in my mind, a prophet could be a teacher of the word, a teacher of righteousness. They could have dreams. They could have visions. They could just have understanding of dreams and visions. Uh, it says, we know what we've already seen this, that in the time of the end that the uh, God's people will be in possession of the testimony of Yeshua, which is the spirit of prophecy, in the book of Daniel. And this is what I find interesting. We're not necessarily looking for new dreams and visions per se, we're looking for understanding of old dreams and visions. If we look in Daniel chapter 12, and I think this really says a lot here, Daniel chapter 12, Daniel is told uh, in verse 4, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So here we go again. When is the time of the end? Well, the time of the end is the time of the end. It's the time when Yeshua is going to return. And technically, that isn't the time of the end. It's not the end of the end. The end of the end is at the end of the book of Revelation at the end of the millennium, that's when all things are restored. But the, the segment, the close of this age, will culminate in Yeshua returning. And this is what it's talking about here. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. I emphasize the book 
because so often we, we kind of misapply just the way the Bible is given. We have chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And we divide it into chapters. And in Daniel, in the book of Daniel, it's pretty easy to divide those up into those chapters. Although Daniel 10 through 12 is all one dialogue, all, uh, all one vision. Daniel 10 and 11 is the vision. The vision proper is in Daniel 11. The prelude to the vision is Daniel chapter 10. The vision proper is Daniel 11. And then the timeline that's given in Daniel chapter 12 is the timeline for the vision of Daniel chapter 10 through 12. It's all one. It's, it's the prelude to the prophecy. It's the prophecy itself. And then it's the interpretation, if you will. All the prophecies seem to have at least a little bit of an interpretation. And we see that in Daniel chapter 12. But the interesting part is, when we start to take apart Daniel chapter 10 through 12, we can see clearly that it's exactly the same storyline, if you will, of Daniel chapter 8. So then we can put Daniel chapter uh, 8 and 10 through 12 together as one story, each giving a little bit of different events, but there are enough similarities that we can definitely link them together. So then when we get onto that concept, we say, well, hey, is there any other uh, chapters in Daniel that you can do that? Well, we back up one more chapter to chapter 7, and we can see, okay, Daniel chapter 7 is actually a copy with a little bit different information, but enough information that we can see that these chapters are the same. Now, when we get to Daniel chapter 9, we see something quite different. We see Daniel 7, 8, 10 through 12 as symbolic, at least a little bit, but Daniel chapter uh, 10 through 12 is more literal than it is symbolic. And chapter 9 is definitely literal. So we see a difference in these chapters. When we, when we criti critically analyze the information in Daniel 7, 8, 10 through 12, we can see similarities that are rock solid. But when we get to Daniel 9, we see very little similarities. It's almost like this is talking about something completely different. And the reason why... It seems like that because it is that. Daniel 8, 10, and uh, 8, uh, sorry, 7, 8, and 10 through 12 are dealing with information, events that are going to transpire just prior to the second coming of Yeshua. That's what those chapters are for. Chapter 9 of Daniel is focused primarily on the first coming of Yeshua. That's why it's so different. It's talking about the return from the captivity and the amount of time, the 490-year period, 77s, 70 sabbatical years uh, coming up to the time of the first coming of Yeshua. That is the purpose, that is the sole purpose of Daniel chapter 9. That's what Daniel was praying about, the return from the captivity and the coming of the Messiah. That's the answer that he got in Daniel chapter 9. The problem is, is when we're trying to link these chapters together, when there is no link, we have to fabricate a link, and that's been, that's been done in the past. We're not going to go through that now. Um, my point here is that in verse 4 of Daniel chapter 12, it says, shut up the words and seal the book. Not the last chapter. Seal the book. There are things right from Daniel chapter 1 through Daniel chapter 12 that are not unsealed until the time of the end. Somebody says, well, you know, it's all the first six chapters are all history. Yes, but the first six chapters are not only history, they're prophetic. You see, prophecy repeats itself in principle. So... 
not the identical things are going to happen, but because human beings are fallen. Um, so in the first six chapters of Daniel, we've got events that were transpiring under Daniel's captivity in Babylon. Well, guess what? The people in the time of the end are going to be in captivity by who? By Babylon. This is what we read about in Revelation chapter 19. So I propose that there are going to be many similarities between the first six chapters of Daniel and the last chapters of the book of Revelation. Because Babylon will be in control again, not some empire in the Middle East. Uh, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And so she will take possession of the world. We've already talked about that. The little horn will end up in Jerusalem and uh, sit as a queen. This is what we talk, this is what it talks about in Revelation chapter 17 and 18. So all the same things are going to be happening. God's people will be taken captive by the world. And that's because Babylon will at that time be a world empire and control the whole world. So there will be no, uh, no actual place, country that you can run to and be safe just because you're outside of the Middle East. It, uh, Middle East will control everything. Babylon the Great will rule from Jerusalem and give out the rules from there for the whole world because there will be a new world order system. So we're not going to know these events in the book of Daniel. In the whole book of Daniel, there's going to be things that are sealed until the time of the end. So that's what we should be studying. We should be doing exactly what the prophets did, is search the scriptures uh, to see what's coming and when it's coming. And lo and behold... Lo and behold, those people that are willing to humble themselves and get off their own thrones and start digging in the dirt, the minds of Scripture, are finding out that what they've been taught hasn't been 100% without error. Because that's what truth is for. It's to displace error. So we're told that the book would be unsealed in the time of the end. That's the time that we're living in. And that's what Yeshua spoke about when he, asked, he was asked, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And then he went through all the things, and it was, a, it was sort of like the trailer. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 are kind of like the trailer of Daniel and Revelation. It should be enough to get you interested. In fact, he even points us back to the book of Daniel in those in those trailers in all three of those trailers two by name in mark and matthew but one by event in luke when he says you'll see jerusalem surrounded by armies know that its desolation is near this is talking about the abomination of desolation so in all three of those chapters they're like a trailer to the book of daniel and, of course, the book of Revelation wasn't written at the time that Yeshua spoke on the Mount of Olives. That was written much later, um, decades later. But lo and behold, it's further explanation, further details on Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and also the book of Daniel. Very, very easy to demonstrate that the book of Daniel and Revelation are sister books, and you cannot separate them. So... There we go, and um, I'd like to just open it up. Um, so, so while you're while you're thinking, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share a little bit, and and I've done this before, and I've been thinking I need to do it a little more concise, so that we can see where things are going. You know, we could talk about the very end, the abomination, the desolation, which we have, you know, the millennium and, and all that kind of stuff. But we've got quite a few events that are going to happen prior to these events of the time of the end. What's going to happen during the millennium, all of these things. But we've got events that are leading up to that that we don't want to wait until we arrive at the millennium to find out what's going on at the millennium. We've got to, 
we've got to know in advance. We've got to know why the Millennium teaching is, is an important teaching for us to understand uh, prior to arriving at the Millennium so that we're not deceived. I, I, I really believe that the Millennium is probably the best calculated deception that Satan actually has come up with. Uh, the, the wrong concept of the Millennium is, is absolutely the most deadly teaching that he has. Because we know, we know from the example of Yeshua in the wilderness that all Satan wanted Yeshua to do was to bow down and worship him. And, and we can see from Genesis to Revelation, uh, Satan's plan has been to hijack this planet. And he's done a really good job. In fact, there's very few that follow God uh, with all their heart today. There's an awakening going on, and thank God there's an awakening going on. There's going to be a shift, a major shift in the next several months that's happening right now. And it's for the purpose of getting people off the fence so that they're not cold or they're not uh, lukewarm, or sorry, so that they're either cold or hot, but not lukewarm. There's so many people that are lukewarm. And I believe that the evil that we're seeing today is for the purpose of getting people off the fence. They have to make a decision on which side of the issues are they going to be on. Are they going to be on the issue, the sides of evil? And I could just ramble on on all this all the things that the evil are doing but i don't need to do that you guys know what they're doing or are they going to side for people that want to do what's right and it doesn't mean that people are going to do everything that's right but there will be a shift there will be a shift for people to move in the direction of righteousness and that's where that's really where we come in if we think we know anything so in the next few months, we know what's going on in the world. We know what's going on in the United States, the most powerful nation the world has ever known. It seems to be falling from grace, and there's good reason for that. One is the evil. The evil that has been manifest in the United States alone is taking it down. Now, I want to do, I want to do a little bit of history, and I know there's going to be people that will dispute this history. Nevertheless, it's still history. We can't get away from it. Uh, during the time of the Reformation, and let's just start maybe Martin Luther. And Martin Luther definitely had, uh, had a few challenges, but what he did know was there was something wrong with the church that he had been accustomed to and he had taught in. He recognized that. And so he started to turn the corner. This is kind of what we have going on right now. There's people out there that are starting to recognize that what they've been taught is not true. And way back in Martin Luther's time, they called that the Reformation. Well, we're going through the same Reformation process today. There are people in all churches that are waking up to the idea that maybe they haven't got the goods uh, according to what the Word says, and they're going back to the Word to find out what the Word teaches. When Martin Luther did that, it brought him in conflict with his brethren. Anyone been there before? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We are, we are begin in the beginning stages, and, and you know, the real, real beginning stages of the last Reformation, uh, that's going to build. And we're told that, that in the time of the end, there would be prophets, they would be teaching, and, and I believe that, that we're going to see things that we've never thought possible. And so we're at that time now. People are becoming either hot-er or colder. They're saying, no, I don't want any of that. I want to do what the left wants to do, you know, kill babies and all kinds of stuff. It's like all in the name of freedom. Isn't that wonderful? Is it, they just got this whole thing flipped 
on their heads in the name of freedom because that's what Satan has claimed all the way along. He just wants freedom. And if you gave people the freedom that I can give them, that Satan can give them, God, if you would just give them the freedom that I can give them, they will all fall down and worship me. You see, this is what this is all about. It's to prove that the creatures that God made in his own image, given opportunity, would rather worship the devil than God. That's what this whole thing is about. That's what it was about in the wilderness. That's what it was about in the time of Job. You know, just take everything he has, God, and he'll worship me. That's, that's the way it works, God. And everyone knows that. I've proven it. I got everything under control. And God says, well, I think you've overlooked someone. And that's exactly where we find ourselves today. Is people are going back to the book and they're starting to see that they've missed something. There's a reformation process going on. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to see all the light at one time. But they're going to start seeing light and they're going to start making choices, hard choices that's going to put them in conflict with their families, with their churches, and, and all these things. This is what we're, we're seeing. So what happened during the First Reformation, the time of Martin Luther and, and all these other ones, there's a whole raft of, of people that were involved, and that's, of course, why we got all the different churches we have. Uh, the main reason is, is when the church... Uh, leader, that one who the church was named by, uh, i.e. Martin Luther, the Lutheran church, <laughs> Calvinism, or wh whatever, whatever it was, Methodist, Methodist uh, whatever church they belonged to, when that leader died, then they locked down the doctrines of the church and said, this is what Lutherans believe, this is what Methodists believe, this is what you know, Jehovah Witnesses believe. This is what Mormons believe. This is what Seventh-day Adventists believe. When the leaders that began the churches began to die and fade from the scene, what they did was they met, went into preservation mode. It's called conservatism. It's conserving what you have so you don't lose what you have. It's putting a fence around all your doctrines so that nobody can get in and so that nobody can get out. So they have full control over what people believe. This is what happened in the churches in the process of the Reformation. This is what's happening today because we have the same thing going on. We have people that are starting to open the book and question the pastors and their, and their leaders and saying, hey, this is, you know, I've been reading this, I've been studying this, I've been watching this YouTube uh, because we are in the information age. I was told when I was in college teaching that you better be careful what you say at the front of the class because they're checking you out every time you say something that might be wrong. And that's the problem that the churches have today. I was told when I was in these classes that don't ever think you're the smartest one in the room. Well, I was the teacher. I, was, I had to be the smartest one in the room. No, they taught us that you don't have to be the smartest one in the room. You have to know where to find the information, and that's what you have to teach the students, is where they can find the information that they need to get through and be successful. The problem that we have in the churches today is they haven't learned that lesson, and they've locked down. Can you imagine what a school would be like if you went to school and they were still teaching things that they were teaching in the 1800s? Like, seriously. So, it wouldn't be long before that, that school would not have any students in it because what they're teaching is outdated. Now, if you put that into a theological room, we're told that the light will be given at the time of the end. So those that are teaching light that was so-called light 100 or 200 years ago 
are locking those doctrines down and they're not allowing their parishioners to think for themselves, to question the authority of their churches that they go to. This is not going to end well. God is not going to share his glory with anyone. His word will have the final say. And, and that's just the way it is. Can you imagine Andrew and Peter were disciples of John the Baptist, if I have my memory serve me correctly. And John the Baptist was one of the greatest prophets that ever there ever was, according to Yeshua. Yet, don't miss this point, John the Baptist did not have all the light, and Andrew and Peter shifted their allegiance to Yeshua and left John the Baptist in the wilderness. Ooh. Wow. That's because there was an advancement of light, a new understanding and a fulfillment of prophecy. And God's people that were following John the Baptist shifted and went to this new understanding that even John the Baptist was not grasping at that time. Now that doesn't mean that John the Baptist died without a greater understanding. But John the Baptist nevertheless died with most likely an incomplete understanding of the prophecies that he studied. This is Bible. This is how God works. If we're not willing to shift gears from those that have gone before us to maybe a new idea, we may be left in the past, maybe left in the dust. So what happened during the Reformation? The people that went back to the word began to be persecuted. So what did they do? They fled. They left where they were being persecuted and they went up north into Great Britain to, to get away from Rome and the influence of Rome. And then when the persecution started happening there in, in UK, in England, the people left there and then they came to the United States of America. And then we know the, a lot of the rest of that story, but some of the things we don't quite understand is there was talk of um, creating this new nation and with the constitution that invoked the name of God, the Lord Almighty. And, and so there's no question that this nation was founded on principles, on biblical principles. And people will say, well, you know, they were Masons and they were this and they were that. There's no question that there were people of all different flavors. But 65, if I've got this correct, 65 out of the 66, I believe that I've got those numbers, it might be 64, it might be 65, um, out of the, the signers of the Declaration of Independence, uh, Independence and the authors were some sort of, Pro of Protestant denomination. And there was one that was not a Protestant and he was a Catholic. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So these people were, um, some of them were theologians, some of them were pastors, but they had no intention to remove God from the political arena. What they didn't want to have was the state that legislated the, the, uh, the religion. And because that's what they left. And that's why, actually, that the United States became the greatest nation on the earth, because it was built on the freedom of religion. Not the freedom of God. The freedom of God being taken out. That, that enters into bondage. But it was the freedom to believe in God and to follow your conscience. And it was also 
not freedom from religion. Yes, the idea, the freedom of church and state, even in the Constitution, you can't prove that the Constitution was for the purpose of separating church and state. That's not the purpose, because the Constitution invokes the name of God. So the Constitution recognizes the only true God and Yeshua. There's no question about that, because that's what they believed. And, and so to say that the separation of church and state, and you can't have prayer in schools and all of, all of this, it just means that you cannot legislate the religion. And that's where the problem is going to come from. There's going to be a legislation of, of the religion. And there's going to be some really good reason for that, because we are facing right now, and this is kind of where... We'll, we'll finish up on this because I think this is really important for us to understand where we are in time right now as far as the prophecies are concerned. We have in Daniel chapter uh, 11. Let's go and we're going to look at a few verses here before we, before we close off. Because this tells me the time that we're living in. In Daniel chapter 11, which is the same as Daniel chapter 8, which is the ram and the he-goat, the kings of Media and Persia. So this is further explaining the events that will uh, bring on the time of the end. And it's a war between the kings of Media and Persia and the realm of Greece. We're going to, uh, Daniel chapter 11 verses, uh, we'll start in verse 2. It says, and now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and a fourth will be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Now, I just want to go back to chapter 10, verse 14. It says here in verse 14, now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, or the end days, last days. For the vision is for many days yet to come. So this tells us the reason why Gabriel has come is to make Daniel understand what's going to happen in the end of time. Now he says, now I've come to tell you what's the... Uh, tell you the truth. So this is the heart of the matter. This is the beginning of the time and the end. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and a fourth will be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So here we have some explanation from Daniel chapter 8, and this is fully explained here, and this is what we expect in prophecy, in a repeat and enlarged prophecy. We're told that the kings of Media and Persia are going to unite, and a fourth one will be far richer than them all. Um, so here we have, here we have the, the kings of Media and Persia in Daniel's day. So any time in prophecy, we know that if this prophecy is for the time of the end, we take the areas, the geographical fixes that, that the prophet is given, and we overlay them with the, uh, the areas of today. And we can see this in the time of the height of the kings of Media and Persia. Persia basically enveloped the whole empire. It was the stronger empire. And we see that it took in the whole Middle East. And when we see this, when we actually uh, can look at this we can see that it's exactly these same countries that we're looking at today. So when we, when we actually try and analyze what this is saying, it says that, that these kings will start to align themselves together and there will be a fourth one that will be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. And that word Greece is Javan. We've looked at that before. We've got to go back to Genesis chapter 10 verses 1 through 5, we find out that Javan, here again, we're doing exactly the same thing that we just did 
is in order to find out what this Grisha means, it's actually a mistranslation, it should be Javan, it was assumed by the translators it was talking about Greece, and that's why we get Alexander the Great and all the rest of it, because of that mistranslation. It actually is Javan. We've got to go way back to Genesis chapter 10 to find out what this thing is about Javan. Well, Javan was the, the son of Japheth, uh, Noah's son. And from him, it tells us that all the coastlands, peoples, and the nations uh, of the West came from them. So this, is, this makes a lot of sense now, if we're reading this in the time of the end, that we've got the kings of Medo Persia squaring off against all the Western nations. Well, that's exactly what we can expect. The question is, how far in the future is it going to happen? And I've been, I've been saying this for 20 years, that this is going to happen. We've been watching the events develop. But we have never, obviously, been closer to the event as we are now. But we are pushing up against the edges of this right now. With the weakening of the United States, with what has happened in the United States, we are on a collision course with this prophecy. And it's not going to happen that far away. If it doesn't happen before the next election in the United States, it will happen shortly after that election. And I want to explain why. Because it says in verse 3, then a mighty king, well, first before we get there, this fourth empire, this fourth Persian empire, would be none other than Saudi Arabia. Very interesting, just in the last year, Saudi Arabia has been allied with the United States, and we've seen that weakening since the Biden regime, because they have shown to be so weak against Iran. Saudi Arabia has been looking for better allies in the Middle East. So they've gone to Russia, they've gone to China, they've gone to India, and now they're starting to sell their oil to, to those countries as well. So we've seen a major shift in, in Saudi Arabia, which is the far richer. So we've seen this. This is, this is on, on the move right now. Just recently uh, was a 50-year, I believe, something like a 50-year that they have been selling the oil in, uh, in petrodollars, United States dollars. And they are now making the shift going from, they have not renewed that contract with the United States, from what I understand. Ryan, you may know a little more about this than I do, uh, but I understand they, ha they are making the shift now to accept sales in, um, in different dollars other than the United States dollar, which is a major stab in the back to the United States, because what that does is it puts the nail in the coffin as far as the U.S. dollar is concerned. And so this is a major, major, major shift that's gone on. So we see everything being put in place. And then it says here, Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Now, here we go and start to speculate on what these prophecies are saying. I can't see anything other than that mighty king being Donald Trump. It certainly isn't, uh, it certainly isn't Joe Biden. And it certainly isn't Kamala Harris because it's a male. It is a mighty king and he shall rule with great dominion. So we're, we're talking about uh, someone doing according to his will, not her will. So here's my, here's my prediction, if you will. My best read on these prophecies is that this mighty king, I believe to be Donald Trump, he will, he will win the election. Um, but with that is going to come the left is going to start burning down cities in the United States. They're not gonna, they're not just gonna roll over. 
and, uh, and so we are headed for extreme turmoil. And we can look around in the different countries. Ryan, that's why I asked what was going on in, uh, in England, because I saw some news articles that were pretty wild-looking demonstrations on, on those that are opposing immigration. Now, what's so important about immigration? Because they have invited the terrorists to come in. I would never have thought what has happened would happen. We are set up for major, major disruption. I'm, I'm starting to tell people that this fall, you need to have in your storehouse enough food to get to spring. It's just the way it is. There is going to be a little time of trouble, I believe, if not before the election, it will develop, it will be developing, but after the election, it's going to accelerate. And uh, we're talking, this war could come shortly after uh, the election. Definitely within the four years, because Donald Trump, it says, if I'm reading this right, in verse 4, it says, and when he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. <laughs> Keep reading. But not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled for his kingdom, shall be uprooted even for others besides these. Now I want you to go back to Daniel chapter 8. And I want to read something there. Daniel chapter 8. It will start reading in verse 5. Daniel chapter 8, verse 5. And as I was considering, suddenly the male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole Mediterranean. Is that what it says? Sure. Across the surface of the whole earth. There's a, there's a picture of the whole earth. That's what it says. This is a, this is a perfect um, example of going back to the Bible and seeing exactly what it says. It doesn't say across the Mediterranean. It says across the surface of the whole earth. Well, if these prophecies were not going to be understood until the time of the end, certainly those at the time of the end are going to know what the surface of the whole earth is. You can go into any country, I don't care whatever country it is, and if you ask them for a map, if you were in a store where they had such a thing, you would be able to get a world map, and this is what it would look like. He, we here in the time of the end are looking at a map of the whole earth come from the west, that would be the United States, come from the west across the surface of the whole earth. Interestingly enough, it says, it says with great detail, it says without touching the ground. There's only one way you can get to the kings of Media and Persia without touching the ground. That's the only way you can do it. You either have to go by air or you have to go by boat. There's no other way to do it. It came from the west without touching the ground. And it had a notable horn. That's the mighty king that we just read about in Daniel chapter 11. Because this is a parallel prophecy. So the notable horn and the mighty king are synonymous. They're exactly the same being. He came to the ram that had two horns that he had seen standing beside the river and ran at him with furious power. Now, this is, this is the goat now. This is not the notable horn. The notable horn is the first king or the dominant king that leads the charge against the kings of Media and Persia. I propose that because Donald Trump and his associates... And I'm not trying to paint him into somebody he's not. He is who he is. We all know that. But the fact of the matter is, 
those in his circle that have great influence on him are Christian leaders. Christian leaders recognize the evil of Islam. They are counseling them on the ideology of Islam and what their game plan is. Their game plan is to take over the whole world. This is why he's saying openly that these migrants are going to get shipped out. All these illegal migrants are going to get shipped out. And the number one people that he's going to be looking at are people from the areas of the Middle East, from countries that are questionable at best. So this is, this is what's going on. So this is, this is forcing the issue with Islam because they know they're on a collision course with Donald Trump. And so this is what is bringing all of this to the front right now. This is why they've come in in droves because they've taken advantage to uh, do the Trojan horse thing while they've been invited in. They were invited to come in, just like that Trojan horse. And they are going to be ready when it's go time. It's going to be go time when this mighty king rises, this notable horn, and he will lead the charge against Islam. And it says here in verse 7, or verse 6, Then he came to the ram that had two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, Islam, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with furious power. He is so mad that he's charging with furious power. That means something has happened both in, in two different regards. One is the terrorism at home. And also something has happened with Israel. These are the two catalysts that break the back. And then it goes on to say, And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against the ram, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. This should put to rest any idea that there's going to be an Islamic Antichrist. Islam is going to be over, done, completely done, because the threat of Islam is actually the threat, uh, the global warming threat uh, today. It's not oil, it's Islam and what they're up to. And the Trump administration is fully, and I emphasize this because it's a fact, they are fully aware of what the Muslims are up to. They want to bring Sharia law to the whole world and control the whole world. It, it's open. There's, it's no secret for anybody that wants to understand this. Uh, and that's what they know. And they are not going to allow it. The West is not going to allow it. And they're going to completely destroy Islam. And then it says in verse 8, Therefore, Daniel chapter 8, verse 8, Therefore, the male goat grew very great. So this movement with these Western nations, and Russia and China will be involved as well. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. And when he, he became strong, the large horn, that's this king, this mighty king, is broken. And in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. This is basically a carbon copy for... Uh, or for Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through 3 to 4. And so these are the events. So, why am I, I going here? Number one, if we've got these prophecies right, we're not going to have to wait very long to see it happen. And so we're going to know soon enough. But the purpose of the prophecies is so that we can have advance warning. That's why God gives it to his last day people. So they don't need to be taken unawares. They're obedient to his word. And that qualifies them uh, actually to, be, uh, to have the spirit of prophecy. And the leading of the spirit of Christ who was in the prophets. And... But the thing is, is the Jews were obedient, but did not have the spirit of prophecy 
for the Spirit of Christ. The Jewish leaders, although they appeared rigid in their religion, and they appeared righteous by all outward appearance, they were destitute of the Spirit of Christ to help them interpret the prophecies. So we've got to have the righteousness of Christ in our hearts, not on the outside. The heart will change the outward appearance, but the, the conversion has to go deeper than just the outward adorning of, of the flesh. So this is why we need to seek him daily. Um, this is why we need to get diligent. This is why we need to get hot. Uh, we don't want to be um, lukewarm. We want to anoint our eyes with eyesav. And maybe we'll finish up on those verses because that seems to be a good place to finish. So it says here, in chapter 3 of Revelation, a little admonition for us here in the time of the end. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that they are neither cold nor hot. I, I, w I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. That's not what we want to experience. So what do we have to do? Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. So are we claiming that? Well, I've decided not to claim that. I am poor. <laughs> And we know that if we go back to the Mount of, uh, Mount of Blessings, then we can see here that Yeshua was talking about those that were poor of spirit. So we are not claiming to be rich. We are not claiming that we need nothing. We are claiming we need everything. We need the, we need the spirit. I counsel you to buy of me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And white, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and I anoint and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice, this is the spirit of Yeshua, which is the spirit of prophecy in the time of the end. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has ears, has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Friends, it is time to get serious uh, with not only what we think about what we do. And we need, to, we need to go back to the Word. We need to take a second look. And we need to study these things. Those verses that we went through today, I would recommend that you get really familiar with those verses so that you would be able to Meet anyone on the street and say, hey, have you seen this? Uh, we're knocking on the door. We're not going to be waiting very long anymore to see these things be fulfilled. So with that, let's, uh, let's close uh, with prayer. How about that? Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word. It is sure. And we thank you, Father, that you are working on our hearts and minds and we give you full permission that the work that you've started in us, we know and we recognize you've started the work in us and we ask that you would finish it. 
Even when we're kicking and screaming, Father, we ask that you would finish this work so that we can be ready. Not only ready for your coming, but we can be ready when all breaks loose on this planet. That we will be a light that will help people understand the direction that they need to go. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.